In the past, paleontologists weren't really known to be on the vanguard of technology. The techniques of finding fossils and the techniques of excavating fossils haven't really changed in about 150 years. My day in the field is much like my predecessors. We're standing here in a mining pit in southern New Jersey. New Jersey is quite famous in vertebrate paleontology, particularly in dinosaur paleontology. The sediments that surround us here are about 65 million years old and they were laid down in a shallow sea that existed at this location. This sea was just teeming with life. There were giant sharks here, there were giant marine reptiles like mosasaurs and plesiosaurs. There were dinosaurs on the beach not 10 miles from here. And so we find fossils throughout this section, but there's one particular layer where it looks like something cataclysmic occurred. We find this death assemblage that is just chock full of fossils. Everything died, everything landed there, turtles, crocodiles, fishes, invertebrates, everything. And we know at this location we're very close to the end of the Cretaceous period, which occurred about 65 million years ago. 65 million years ago, there was an asteroid impact off of today's Yucatan Peninsula, Mexico, that wiped out about 65% of species on the planet. So it begs the question then, is this that day? And we don't know the answer yet. Science by nature is an adversarial system, right? Scientists argue with each other. We're constantly trying to falsify each other's work. That's what you want to happen, even if it's somebody trying to falsify your work, because um, if they fail to falsify it, then that builds the, uh, the fortitude of your hypothesis. And in order for your hypothesis to be falsifiable, other scientists have to have access to your original data. Right now, if another scientist wants to falsify one of my hypotheses about a fossil, they have to come to Philadelphia or wherever that fossil is curated to physically look at the specimen. If scientists all over the world can have access to that data, then they can very easily engage in the scientific process. We've been using uh, hammers and shovels and pickaxes and chisels and burlap and plaster for 150 years, and those are still our basic tools of the trade. Uh, but recently, we've also added to that uh, arsenal uh, 3D laser scanners, 3D printers. So this is the humerus, or the upper arm bone, of a large plant-eating dinosaur called Paralotitan stromeri that our team discovered in Egypt. We scanned the bone with a 3D laser scanner, and then we printed it out with a 3D printer at a 1 to 10 scale. So the original bone here is about 1.6 meters. It would come up to about my eyes, I guess. It has great fidelity, and so we can see muscle attachments here. We can see places where the bone was uh, deformed and cracked a little bit by geological processes. I could send this to a colleague somewhere else in the world, and they could be looking at exactly the same thing that I'm looking at in my lab, and we could collaborate over it. Uh, without anyone having to hop on a jet plane. But once we have this uh, data digitized, um, it's permanent, it doesn't degrade, and we can port it around the world uh, wherever we like. And so much the same as a, a physician in Philadelphia may collaborate with a physician in Australia looking at the same CAT scan, now we can do the same thing with paleontological remains. I think that uh, the younger paleontologists will probably embrace this very much uh, more than maybe some older paleontologists. I'm sort of right on the cusp. Um, and I think for my students, this is going to be second nature in their careers. Of course they're going to laser scan everything. Of course they're going to use 3D printing technology to, to reproduce fossils. That's just going to be the way it is going forward.